Welcome to Pleasant Street United Methodist Church this beautiful Sunday day. Our announcements include um, our joint St. Luke's and Pleasant Street men's group will meet this Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. by Zoom meeting, a link that will go out on Monday by email. You are invited in prayer to join in prayer via conference call this Wednesday at 7 a.m. Call in through your phone or connect by computer. Look for an email later this week. Pastor Ben's office hours are from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Wednesdays, and he is available by phone and for home visits by appointment with precautions for COVID. Please reach out. Offerings and pledges can be sent by check to 8 Pleasant Street, Salem, New Hampshire, or placed in an offering plate. Are there any other announcements? Then we'll go on to our opening prayer. Lord God, thank you for welcoming us into your presence this day, for your invitation to receive your grace, and for your way of transforming our lives with your abiding love, both as individuals and as families united in your name. Lead us, guide us as your people, that we might bring your faithfulness to bear with our lives, to grow in our friendship with you and one another. May our lives proclaim your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Our call to worship is inspired by Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when families are united together in God's kindness and blessing. And we, we, know we know and trust in the unity of the bond of love, which proceeds from the throne of grace and draws us together into harmonious doing and being. Open your heart to sing to the Lord today. How good it is to worship the Lord. Let the rain of blessing water. Let the rain of blessing water your soul. Let the anointing of God's love wash over your life. Our hymn is um, "Blessed Be the Tie That Binds" from the United Methodist Hymnal Number Five Five Seven. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Good morning. I'm Pastor Ben. This is Pleasant Street United Methodist Church. Welcome to all joining us on the live stream. I invite you to share any joys and concerns. Yes. Concern over aging, and it's more difficult each day. All right, concern for uh, energy decreasing and uh, slowing down. We'll keep you in prayer. Bernie. 
All right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ruthie. Definitely a joy from this past week. Yes. Amen. A joy to wake up and uh, this morning and be here. Amen. We're with you in that. Yes, Terry. Uh, Thank you, Terry. Uh, sharing joys uh, that her mother's uh, test came back ne negative and that the paralysis was related to a virus uh, in her vocal cords. And, oh, and Terry's niece had a baby boy. And also a general prayer for uh, the welfare of all, because we never know what's going on in, in folks' lives. Are there any others? Pam. We have two or three areas within this country that have had some serious issues, and I think both Georgia and Texas need to be kept in prayer. And, and if you really want to go to it, Brazil's not having a good time either. They've got this COVID going on down there, and they don't have it under control. Yes, definitely. Pam is requesting prayer for two or three areas of this country with, that, is, that are going through serious troubles, uh, Texas and Georgia, um, two of those. Also, uh, remembering Brazil during this time. Uh, they're really struggling with the coronavirus. Let's be in a spirit of, oh, yes. I want to thank you for this service. There's a joy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanking, um, thanking me for my service, and thank you all. It's a joy to be here. Let's be in a spirit of prayer with our prayer hymn, O Lord, Hear My Prayer. Father God, we come to you by the Holy Spirit. We come to you, Lord, with a 
variety of joys with a number of concerns. But we come to you in fullness of trust that you hear us and meet us exactly where we are. Father, we ask your presence and invite your grace to rest over our congregation today, over your people gathered. These are tumultuous days. These are strange days in which we are living. And we especially remember areas of this country that are particularly being shaken right now. Lord, we lift up Texas in Georgia. The storms and the rebuilding that is happening, Lord. Bring your strength to bear Father, we lift up the nation of Brazil. We pray that you would guide its leaders, guide its people. In their response to this day, Lord. To this disease, this virus that has been among us, bring wisdom and courage to bear. In the hearts and minds of those entrusted to guide the people and to the people themselves, Lord. A nação do Brasil é muito especial. Father, we lift up the joy that the test came back negative for Terry's mother and the joy of new birth in her family. We thank you, Lord, for this past week, the celebration of Ruthie's birthday. We thank you for her, for her life. Continue to bless her, Lord. And Father, we lift up our sister who is confronting the, the challenges of aging. Just ask for your continued grace in her life to speak your kindness. The clarity of purpose 
and presence that you bring. Father, we thank you for our fellowship and the unity of spirit that we know in your name. And it is with the boldness of the children of God that we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you today. Hi, Rosalie. Hi, Willow. And hi, Bernie. Hi, Ruthie. One year older. You said you were five. Yeah? Oh, awesome. We love that. <laughs> and hello to everyone on our live stream today. I hope you had a great Easter last week. So everyone here and everyone around the world is still impacted by this virus, which we all know is COVID-19, right? And so this virus has caused a huge impact on us. And we have seen schools shut down, businesses close, and you know, a lot of things have been suggested to slow down the spread of this virus. So a lot of people say to wear a mask, not only to protect ourselves, but to protect others. Uh, let's see, other people recommend hand sanitizer, and I always carry this bottle of hand sanitizer. It looks like bubble tea <laughs> with me all the time. People also use disinfecting wipes or sprays to keep the germs away. And so the tricky thing is is that we can't see the virus with our own eyes, right? You only can see the effects of it, the symptoms. And so that's a little bit scary. And so when we do use our masks and our hand sanitizers and we use our disinfecting wipes, we trust that they prevent the spread of the virus and they help protect us. And you know, it also might have been scary to be inside our houses for a little while. It was a few months, right? While their schools were closing. It was a long time. <laughs> and so in our gospel reading today, the disciples had to stay inside too. And they were afraid, but not because of a virus. They were afraid because Jesus had just died and they were scared that whoever killed Jesus would come after them too. And so while they were hiding, Jesus appeared to them, and they were so overjoyed that he was alive. But one of the disciples, he wasn't there, and his name is Thomas. Okay, so keep, keep his name in your head. His name's Thomas. Oh, just like your cousin? Cool, hey, nice. 
And so when Thomas met up with the other disciples, the disciples said, whoa, I, we saw Jesus. Jesus is alive. But Thomas didn't believe. He said, Psst. <laughs> I didn't see Jesus with my own eyes. I need to touch his wounds. I need to touch his nail marks on his hands and touch his wound on his side. Then I'll believe. So later on, Jesus appears to the disciples again. And Thomas believes now because he was there to see it. But this is what Jesus says, and this is something that's really important to know today. So Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen me, but still believe. And so who are the people who have not seen Jesus and still believe? Does anyone know? Yeah, Bernie? Us, yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> yes, and so the virus may give us fear, but God, he drives the fear out. And we might not be able to see God with our own eyes, but we can see what he does. We can see the creation around us. We can see the people that he has made in his image. And see, even though we don't see him, we trust that he will protect us. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, we got to get rid of our masks and we got to get rid of our hand sanitizers. We still got to use that to take care of ourselves, right? So again, blessed are those who have not seen Jesus, but still believe. Jesus is alive, and Jesus is real. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for providing the items that will help us and protect us from this virus. Help us to not be scared and help us to trust in you. You are alive. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and, get, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and, and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. There was a Levite, a, name, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessings his blessing, life, live, life forevermore. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning is from John 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails of his hands and his sides, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it on my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these were written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you might have eternal life through his name. May God add his blessings to these readings. Today we read of the disciple Thomas's desire for something tangible, something tactile, something, some living proof that all of this is real, that God can truly be trusted and that his hope is not in vain. I believe we all have some of Thomas's character in us if we're truthful about it. In our text from Acts today, we have a snapshot picture celebrating their adoption into God's beloved community by selflessly giving of themselves their possessions, their talents, their very lives to further the work of God in the world. Each of these passages from two different books of the Bible tells a story of how God shows up in people's lives to speak to very specific needs. I would like to tell you a story. Prior to our work with the church plant in Southbridge, Milka and I were part of the Jesus Life Center, UMC, in Worcester, Mass. We had come to know the pastor there, Chiago and Selma Vieira, through my service learning internship while I was studying theology in Boston. A day after I met them, the couple was commissioned to begin a church plant among Brazilians in the same city that Milka and I had spent a good part of our lives as medical interpreters in Worcester. Their effort, a new church plant out of the Family United Methodist Church in Saugus, began in 2014 as a home group in Chiago and Selma's uh, living room in their apartment, where we shared fellowship and Bible study in a regular meeting on Friday nights called Savoring the Word. The group also met weekly for worship in the downtown Methodist Church of Worcester, Wesley UMC. While I had designed my practicum for school around working with the children and youth, first in Saugus and then in this fledgling congregation, Milka and I were also invited to take part in the church's leadership, administration, and missional strategy from the very first. Milka was studying business for her undergraduate degree at the time, and since she has a knack for numbers and had always wanted to devote herself more fully to God's business, she was a great fit for the service uh, as treasurer. Milka and I were also married around this time in 2015. After a couple of years had passed, the small group continued to grow in numbers and families and individuals committed to take part in the life of the church and deepened in their relationship with God. Concurrently, Aldersgate United Methodist Church in the Maine South neighborhood of Worcester 
voted together with their pastor and the district superintendent to close its doors. The neighborhood had changed around that church, and its aging congregation had struggled to make connection points with the community. And this in spite of a daycare business in its lower level that had begun as a form of outreach some 40 years prior. With the DS's guidance and pastoring, Aldersgate invited our group to take on the administration of the church's building in 2016. The same year, I graduated from seminary. Over a period of six months, the two groups met in the building, during which time the folks from Aldergate would decide if they would like to continu continue worshiping God together with the Brazilians in admittedly a very different way than they had been accustomed to to that point. I served Aldersgate as legacy pastor for six months, conducting traditional services in English at 9 a.m., and then serving as interpreter later in the morning for the second multi-ethnic service. Aldersgate closed its doors in December of 2016, and Jesus Life Center continued on. About half of that group a dozen or so of the primarily English-speaking and white congregation decided to stay with Jesus Life Center and half opted to move on to other churches in the area. Jesus Life Center had become a multi-ethnic, multilingual church, now speaking Portuguese, Spanish, and English, the primary languages of many of its neighbors. As the months passed, and even as we saw people coming to put their trust in Jesus, Growing in their love of God and deepening in their faith, as treasurer, Milka could see, and she was not alone in her concern, that the humble offerings of an economically disadvantaged community of believers would not be up to the task of meeting the administrative costs and general maintenance involved in keeping a large building in that part of the city. The congregation had received a grant from the conference to support the church plant, but those monies were scheduled by design to diminish over a period of three years. And there was the added complication that the still present daycare's activities took up most of the available space in the building, with the exception of the sanctuary and a small room, uh, meeting room called the library. While the daycare originally had been intended to be a way for Aldersgate to be present in the community's life, the daycare's leadership was not all that open to or friendly about having this new group in their space. An expanding Sunday school with Jesus Life Center did not have the space it needed, let alone any other activities that could potentially happen throughout the week to bring the church to the community and vice versa. It was clear that it was time to take some decisive steps if God's work was, going, was to continue growing among us. I mentioned earlier that my wife was studying business for her undergraduate degree during those years. Sometime in 2017, for one of her classes, Entrepreneurial Engagement, Milka was tasked with creating a business plan for a startup company of her design. One morning, as she contemplated these two spheres of her life, church and school, she prayed for God's guidance to develop a project and idea that would honor God. She did not want to just write another paper. The thought arose, why not develop a business plan for a cafe in the church's space? A cafe would create within the church a welcoming environment for the greater community to gather there, offering a way for the church to connect with people, connect with people and be in conversation with folks who might be estranged from God, or who didn't even know the transformative love of Christ at all while also contributing toward the costs of maintaining that space. A guiding question for us was, how can we bring the light and life of Christ to this part of town? Customers at the cafe would also know that their purchase of a cup of coffee or a Brazilian pastry would go toward the missional outreach and service work of the church in Maine South and beyond. Maine South has historically been one of the tougher sections of the city with high incidences of homelessness, drug addiction, prostitution, crime, and lower income one-parent households. 
In addition to providing a friendly way of relating to folks, the cafe would also be a source of employment for people in the area. Yet another dimension of ministry is discipleship. It seemed a win-win-win. And Milka presented it as an idea to others involved in the church's leadership who loved it. <laughs> A committee was formed in ver uh, with various folks contributing their ideas and heart to the project with an interpreter, and we worked on the business plan, studying the area, the market, and the viability for this kind of venture. The first challenge, if we were to undertake this endeavor, would be the plain fact that a cafe and a daycare would not happily coexist in the church's space. To make a very long story short, the daycare received 10 months notice and after about a year and a half had moved to a new home nearby that was even better than the space that had inhabited for so many years in Aldersgate, more suited to their present needs. Milka and I were reassigned and sent to Southbridge in 2019 and sometime after that the daycare left and renovations began for the cafe. I had become a provisional elder by that point, but the project continued on while we turned our energies to the challenges and joys of launching a ministry in Southbridge. You have heard some of that story already. Visits to the Jesus Life Center in 2019 made it clear that the project had taken on a life that surpassed our hopes, and the cafe's design and construction was even more beautiful than what we had envisioned in our original plans. The team had worked with the city, that's the team there, that's, that's us. <laughs> uh, the team had worked with the cities and the contract and contractors and the cafe was nearly ready to open, pending an approval or two from Worcester when it was 2020. Obviously, the pandemic shifted a few of their projected dates and expectations, but by October 2020, the cafe opened its doors to the public. Could you? In conversation recently with our friends there, Milka and I learned that during the last six months of being open, and this with restricted occupancy, masks, and social distancing, the cafe team had met more people of a wider diversity of backgrounds than they had in the entire six years of church planting in Worcester. Selma said that not a day had gone by in which she had not had the opportunity to pray with someone she had just met. And they have already held several weddings in the cafe's space, which is where the library meeting room used to be. Prayerful intercession is central to all that they do, and God has answered prayers for healing and deepening fellowship with Christ. They are presently working with the conference to see about remodeling the adjoining space to the cafe to make room for a craft workshop, a area for the church's youth, and other plans that continue to evolve as the community dreams and envisions who they are, whose they are and how these realities are expressed in the physical uh, spaces of the church. The guiding hope is that others may know the depths and riches of God's abundant love and mercy as well. God has a plan through Life Garden Cafe, and the church has simply looked to do all, to do all they can to be a part of God's mission in the city. The cafe is solvent, and already contributes to the cost of keeping the building's lights on. If you're ever in Worcester, <laughs> check it out for yourself, Life Garden Cafe, 1048 Main Street. To return to our text today, we see that Thomas will not believe until he has seen some tangible proof that what the others say is true and the Lord meets him where he is. The picture of generosity we read about in Acts, the vision for lives centered in God's abundant life, is another expression of individuals in the community who have devoted themselves to making the generosity and abundance of God known to all around, in tangible, earthy ways that speak to people's immediate needs. 
This last story gives us a jolt because it is such a stark contrast to our lives in the present day United States. But it also challenge us, challenges us in our dreaming for how our lives and the spaces that God has entrusted to us, his people, might shine for his glory. And how our community would invite others to know the hope we have in Christ. The tomb is still empty. Death is still defeated. What would it look like if this knowledge and trust were the starting point in our conversations about the future of Pleasant Street? Are there obstacles? Are there impediments? Are there hard questions to ask? Yes, yes, and yes. Has not God created us for such a time as this? Let's work through them together. We can see it this way. Every problem we, we confront brings an opportunity. When we consider these spaces here, these buildings, they are a means to a greater end, a vehicle for expressing the heart of a people transformed through God's Holy Spirit. It is not about the building, but the ministry. Generosity of spirit has a way of dismantling the mysterious power that money continually exerts in our lives. Jesus Life Center sought to be generous with its space, to relate to the community in a way that would reach them where they were and which brought humble service and a spirit of hospitality to a section of town noted for its challenges. It's rare in our day and age, frankly, that people just venture into a sanctuary on a Sunday morning. And models around church life and community that worked well some years ago do not function the same way in our present day. Is Jesus any less faithful? Is the gospel any less good news, less powerful or transformative? By no means. I am new to you and you to me. I do not have the answers for what this might look like in Salem. But this is as it should be. We are the body of Christ, and it is our respective gifts and graces that God's, it is in our respective gifts and graces that God's work is most powerfully revealed through us. Let's ask God to guide us in this. Let's share our ideas and dream together with God. I know that God's Spirit is already prompting many of you or has been for many years, stirring your hearts to have you step out in new ways that might be scary, that might involve risk. Some of you have a holy discomfort about the way things are right now. I know this because you have even shared them with me. How might we dream together with God? In joyous celebration of the gifts and talents we all bring to the table in our unique diversity and graces, in all our messiness too, because that's certainly a part of life together in discipleship, but in deepening trust that God is with us on this wonderful and difficult, often painful adventure that is life on this earth. In my humble experience, the life of faith makes the most sense has tangible, tactile implications when grappled over together in the company of a wide diversity of people. While sharing in a meal in one another's homes, like with savoring the word, or one-on-one, -on -one, in having a cup of coffee with someone who lives on the street. It's the conversations and promptings, the radical embrace of God's amazing grace in these kinds of settings, the stirrings of the spirit that rekindle the dreams and spur the actions to meet the ones hurting among us, who are isolated and alone, who are marginalized and feeling hopeless. Jesus extends a hand to Thomas that unflinchingly reveals his scars to meet him where he is. The early believers of Acts marvel at the abundance of generosity that overflows among them so that no one goes without. The kingdom of God is among us, and it is within us. God's presence becomes tactile, 
tangible, when we commit to journeying with the Lord in humble trust that God has suffered as we do, his hands bear the scars and that there is hope on the other side of the valley. Resurrection life is not only possible, it is the foundational building block of our existence if we would but entrust our doubts to God and believe. Will you trust God with your doubts today? Unlock the inner room of your heart and welcome the expanse of hope that is resurrection life? Amen. Come, Holy Spirit of God, and search our hearts with the light of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Come, let us return to the Lord and say, Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us. Bind up our wounds and revive us. Deliver us from judgment in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let's be in a spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts and graces that you have entrusted to each one of us. We thank you that we can pour out our hearts in fullness of trust, Lord, because you are with us. You are guiding us. You are leading us on this journey. We pray, Father, that uh, as we discern together, you might be glorified, you might be exalted, you might be praised among us, Lord, through us and that others may know your glory, your goodness, your kindness, the strength that you bring, your reconciling, healing love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go back for a second to the peace. <laughs> and because we remembered Brazil earlier, and because it's written through, Brazil is written on my heart, um, I'd like to just uh, share the peace in Portuguese. A paz do Senhor Jesus esteja com vocês. May the Lord's peace be with you. Amen. Peace. <laughs> Let us share. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the, the, the Lord's countenance shine upon you. May God be gracious unto you and bring you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.